there was a three or four month period <laughs> where I meditated six, eight hours, 10 hours, you know, like a lunatic. And the whole thing was just to communicate with aliens. That's the only thing that I was doing all yes. day long for several months was interacting with aliens. And I, I kept track. There was 179 different aliens, different races, different species. I have a whole notebook on it. I wow. just invited, I just, I just invited the CIA to break in and get, get that's another book we need to read. Right. So I kept track of all these different aliens that I was communicating with. Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I have a special treat today. As you may have noticed, I haven't been doing very many interviews lately, but there's one person that I always enjoy interviewing, and that is RJ Spina, my good friend. He is more than just somebody I interview on my channel. He is somebody that I consider a friend that, that wishes me Merry Christmas and, and Happy Thanksgiving and, and somebody I really, really enjoy talking to. And why not just record it? If you don't know RJ Spina, just go and check out my other episodes where I've interviewed him. He's written some amazing books. You can find his website at ascendthefrequencies.com. And he, he, his most recent book, Change Your Mind, is absolutely mind-blowing. And I have found so much amazing material from his teachings. If you don't know, RJ healed himself of permanent chest down paralysis severe chronic illness and life-threatening conditions through his own authentic transcendence. And he has dedicated his life to the freeing and healing of humanity on all levels. And that's just the beginning. When I say that, we're just scratching the surface. So welcome back to the Reality Revolution, RJ. How you been? Thanks. Thank you so much, Brian. The very kind words. I feel the same way. I enjoy talking to you. We're friends. Uh, and both of us just had the idea that, you know, why don't we just talk? Yeah. Just a conversation and just record it because I think a lot of people would like to be, uh, be the fly on the wall for a conversation between you and I. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, my first observation, it's good to talk to someone else that is in the movement of consciousness teaching these topics. Uh, ha uh, it's really fascinating to look at what sort of happened during COVID and how people were responsive and, and, and talking about it. And there's been a, a sort of change a little bit where people are sort of backing away and, and the world is changing a little bit. And I'd like to get your pulse on, on, on how things are going in this movement of consciousness and, and using and analyzing and discussing consciousness as the proactive factor in healing and changing the world. What a what a heavy question to start off with, Brian. Yeah, man. I, 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 give it to you. I, I, I thought we were just gonna hang out. Okay. So all right. It's a it's a great it's a great question. Um, how how I see it, what I tap into, what I feel, um, the knowingness that comes through, the message that comes through, is that really about half the population is firmly entrenched in uh, a 3D matrix. Right where it's kind of just mind body obsession with thoughts, uh, materialism, the, the tangibility of things, which is uh, materialism is right next to the nihilism, by the way. We can get into that if you want. So, but uh, but uh, half the population is actually designed, from my perspective, Ryan, mm -hmm. about half the population is designed to continue to work with themselves in what we would call a three dimensional matrix type consciousness. The other half of the planet is waking up rapidly absolutely rapidly and and from my perspective that's also what is sort of meant to be and through this split if you will mm -hmm. humanity is going to get the opportunity to decide and it always does to decide which direction does it want to go and does it want to stay in a low frequency 3d type matrix and just kind of move the furniture around in the same room or does humanity does the collective consciousness want to move into what you know what is the fourth frequency People keep saying we're going into 5D. Okay, let's be accurate, my friends. Let's anchor. The reason why we have trouble anchoring some of these things in is because we're not accurate. We're not using the right terminology. Energy exists frequentially. We're in the third frequency. We would be moving to the fourth frequency. And that is where about half the population is trying to pull us into that. You can also look at this, Brian, as two very distinct timelines, if we want to look at it from that perspective two very distinct teams, even though there's more than two timelines battling it out, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But 
humanity can move into the fourth frequency. And I, I, I got news for you. That's exactly what's going to happen. I would have never reincarnated if we were going to move backwards. Okay. So there's the real answer. We're going to move into the fourth frequency, but there's going to be this balance because there has to be a balance. There's never going to be the whole planet. This, this is just not true and not accurate because it doesn't work that way. There has to be a balance. So some souls didn't sign up to move into this fourth frequency and some absolutely did. And we're kind of seeing the battle over a timeline really is what we're witnessing. More and more people are open to consciousness, what I call sentience, right? And working with themselves and then with each other and then with the environment in a very holistic, in a very holistic way. And then other people, they're getting more and more entrenched into the ego mind. Now, I want to just add one thing and then I'll and then I'll shut up. So oh. this this obsession this obsession with the ego mind identity, right? It's an addiction. And I want I want everyone to start to understand this. This this collapsing of consciousness, a constriction of energy which forms our humanistic personality, this this human version of this immeasurable I am. This contraction of consciousness the collapsing and constriction of energy becomes an addiction. And people don't even realize that they're addicted to analysis and judgment, to the contraction of their mind and the constriction of their energy, which is why they can't stop thinking. And it, most people have realized their thoughts are negative and they can't stop judging others. They can't stop judging other people. And I want everyone to know that this is an addiction. It's an absolute addiction. And the only way that we overcome this addiction is abstinence from giving into the craving. And the real answer to the abstinence of giving into the craving is to be present, or in other words, meditation. It's interesting because I talk about it on my channel, but there is a phenomenon with the ego mind. And, um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Ra and the Law of One, and they call it the sinkhole of indifference. It, it's the, there's, a, there's a group of people, and it, it, you're right, it's about 50% that are just indifferent and the indifference is an expression of the ego it, it, it's hard to explain because that, that that wouldn't seem to make sense but the indifference it's just they're only worried about what they're doing and and and, and the ego kind of traps them in this indifference they don't really care they don't want to move on they don't want to um, expand their consciousness they don't even if they're provided evidence the ego just quickly tells them ah oh, that's just woo woo and it's ridiculous and pushes them away I'd like to get your perspective of the indifference of, the, of, of that lower frequency. Well, that yeah, that's well said, by the way, and I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. So the, the true self, the I am, right, the true self with the capital S, okay, is not indifferent about anything, okay? And this is also part of, uh, from my perspective, the total misunderstanding or conceptualization of what self-realization or authentic enlightenment actually is. Most of us have this understanding that if someone is actually enlightened or a master, whatever word you want to use, that they become incredibly serious and dour, uh, can't crack a joke, or uh, they, they become allergic to having a good time. Okay, the opposite is actually true. Okay, so this so this indifference that you're talking about has to do with keeping one small. It has to do with keeping one small. The expansion of getting involved in greater understandings, their own greater consciousness, the greater good, cannot happen within this constriction and collapsing of consciousness, and therefore the constriction of energy. The sinkhole is a, is a great way to great way to do it. Now, if we understand that the ego mind identity is bankrupt, now when I say bankrupt, I mean it authentically and intrinsically. It doesn't know anything. All it does is memorize. That's all it does. Now. Without holding on to the identifications, roles, concepts, beliefs, bodily sensations, experiences, without holding on to these things, the ego mind identity dies. It dies because it's bankrupt. The reason why the mind wants more and more and more information is because it doesn't know anything. So it white knuckles, Brian. It hangs on mm -hmm. for dear life. Now, how that shows itself is this indifference, this not caring. This, this lack of expansion, this lack of evolution, this keeping playing very small, staying within the fragmented, compartmentalized, conditioned, brainwashed mind is really what that is. So we just lose passion. We lose joy. 
we lose the will and determination to create the life that we truly desire, not just individually, but collectively. All of that is gone. And part of it is a, tra it's a, it's a trauma-based response, Brian. Mm -hmm. It's a trauma-based response to kind of turtle up. And then we form this addiction of the constant analysis and judgment of everyone and everything else. And anyone that starts to break free out of that, the people that are addicted to the contraction of their own consciousness, that's why they lash out and judge. It's a trauma-based response. And unless we start to work with ourselves properly, we're not going to be able to move past the trauma. And this is the same trauma that everyone is subject to when they come here. And for me, the key is to get some detachment, non-identification with what we are aware of. And that gives us some space. And as we get some space, we got some room to work and then we can work with our energy properly. And we're going to be able to move past all these things. But I, I completely agree. Half the, half the population has signed up not to ascend, as hard as that might be to hear for some people. It's the absolute truth. The other half signed up to be able to, to be able to and participate in moving into the fourth the fourth frequency. But if someone wants to break free, if they want to break free, they're going to have to examine the compulsion of thinking, of judgment, of analysis, and the most persistent form of suffering is identification. And if we can give up identification, then the, the analysis, the nonstop analysis is, is going to stop because the analysis is really us really revealing all of our identifications, our identifications to certain concepts, beliefs, roles, ideologies, experiences, and so-called knowledge. When you start to give up those identifications and you start to reside in the present moment, it becomes impossible to really judge. And then we're gonna start to create we won't be a consumer. We'll start to create from the unlimited state of what we really are, which is the I am. But until someone really wants to do this, the conditioning and the brainwashing and the low frequencies and how intoxicating this realm is, it, it'll become all too much. Let's, let's step back a little bit and look at the third frequency. It, it feels like it was constructed this way. And I'd love to have this conversation. I've talked to people... Some will say that it's like a play. There's other people that have played me. I'm just an actor in a role and and, and, and I, I might play it differently. Some people will say it's like a game. It's like a you know a, a simulation, but it's a game. You're, 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 you're trying to escape the sinkhole, essentially. You're trying to escape the ego mind. Uh, is this something that just accidentally happened in this frequency? Or do you think this is constructed this way and we're in this environment? And how do you view... The structure of it is is it a game is is it a play and how do you view it <laughs> <laughs> what a great question okay how do i view it okay or the big picture my friend how, how, how i say it is that excuse me the multiverse is a multi-frequential multi-dimensional hall of mirrors designed for self-mastery okay that's my uh, tangible take take on it now when i say self-mastery we can look at this as as a game, right? You know, when we play a video game, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I play I play the old school games, right? So I'm not very advanced <laughs> when it comes to that. I play so, Zuma. So I. I've, right, I play Zuma and uh, pole, pole position. Okay, anyway. Right, right, so, pole position. <laughs> yeah, love it, right? So uh, when, when we're playing a video game, the, the goal is to keep advancing to the next level, the next, you know, clear the screen, you go to the next one. Your avatar gets... Uh, more powerful, wiser, can do more things. I mean, this is this is so accurate. This is absolutely so accurate. the The only real difference between that scenario and what what we are we we are experiencing and everyone else here is that we could jump. So, in other words, when we play a video game, it's it's linear, and that as we clear boards, the the avatar gets more and more advanced, and then we kind of the game gets saved and we pick up where we left off. Right? Okay. So when we have an incarnation, right, and we incarnate here into the into the third frequency, into this into this realm, and the key is to shed the ego mind identity, and then you have the ultimate avatar, which can really do anything because it's a dream state. And when you wake up in a dream, you can do anything. So we can reincarnate into any level of the video game. So when we're playing mm -hmm. Zuma or whatever, whatever game we're playing, we have to keep clearing boards. And then the next time we turn the game on, we get to pick up where we left off. Okay, it, we are not that limited. 
We are nowhere near that limit. So when an incarnation is over, we played a game, we played our character, and the, the game is over. Now, when we decide to reincarnate and play again, we can go into any level of this game within, within the physical universe, by the way, which is the first full dimension, which is 12 frequencies, okay? So we can reincarnate anywhere in there because incarnation is always into the physical universe and the physical universe is the first full dimension that's divided up into 12 frequencies with the bottom three banding together to give one reality and the experience of height, weight, and width, which we call a three-dimensional reality. And that's because the energies are so slow and dense, they need to sandwich together to support one another. Now, as you move up into the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th, that's not the case anymore. So we can come back whenever we want into any one of these levels that we desire. So we're, we're far less limited than we are when we play a video game. But I really feel like where we got video games is exactly what I'm talking about through the process mm -hmm. of, of reincarnation, being able to play whatever character we choose our body. For those that don't think so, inaccurate. We choose our body. We choose the timeline. We choose the frequency and we choose which team we're going to play for. That's right. That's what I said. We choose a lot more than that. Those are the four main ones that most human beings want to know about. So when I say when we choose the team, you can think of the team of uh, uh, white light for liberation and freedom and the advancement of consciousness, or you can choose the, the quote unquote bad guys that are trying to hold everyone down, subjugate, torment, and feed upon. So we get to, we get to choose which team that we want to play for, mm -hmm. but it's a simulation I think I have, I think I just have a problem with that word. Yeah. Um, no one really dies. I talk to dead people all the time. So there's no such thing as death, right? It's like being in one car, getting out of that car and getting into another one. Just all of a sudden you're in a different environment, different surroundings. That's kind of what death, different frequency, different reality. And your understanding of yourself and the greater reality will change. But it is kind of a simulation, except it counts. It counts. It counts. Now, I don't want to keep rambling. What do I mean when I say it counts? Okay. <laughs> so the multiverse is a multifrequential, multidimensional hall of mirrors designed for self-mastery. Now the counting part is the deepening of who and what we are. And who and what we are is love and wisdom whose subsets are talents and abilities. That's the I am from the I am discourses. The I am is our love and wisdom whose subsets are talents and abilities that is given energy in order to create. Now, the score, the deepening, is our evolution. Evolution is the deepening of our eternal reservoir of love and wisdom, whose subsets are our talents and abilities. And we take that with us. And every time we go into a different realm, a different reincarnation, or whatever it is, we take what it is that we have accrued, which is the sentience, which is the I am, the deepening of who and what we are. And then when we go to this incarnation or that incarnation, we have that. That is actually who we are. Now to add one more thing to that, mm -hmm. because this game is incredible. It's the greatest game ever invented, which is, which is why I'm here. So right. we're evolving, the I am, the individualized unit, Brian, RJ, we're evolving. Right. So the incarnation ends and we, we kind of slip right back out of the suit, just like we were slipped into it. We slip right back out. Now we are a, a projection or a tentacle of our higher self. So we are our higher self, just less in volume, two and a half percent. So when the incarnation is over, the octopus pulls that tentacle up. You or me pulls that tentacle up just a little bit. Now, after uh, life review, rest and recuperation, research and development for the next incarnation, when it's time for that tentacle to be projected down again, the quality and the amount of sentience can, can radically change, can radically mm -hmm. change. So the last thing I'll say, but think of a screwdriver and you can change the head on the top of the, you know, the screwdriver, mm -hmm. but about 80 to 90% of the screwdriver stays exactly the same, but you, you can change the head. Mm -hmm. So depending upon how the higher self wants to evolve itself, it can change the quality of the sentience that it imbues one of its tentacles with. It can actually lessen the amount of sentience it's going to project. It could increase the amount of sentience it wants to project. And, and it can change the quality of the sentience itself. But the name of the game is the evolution. And the evolution is by keeping the score, the deepening of our eternal reservoir of love and wisdom, whose subsets are talents and abilities. It's very much like a game 
that has no beginning and has no end. What what you're saying um, aligns with, it's interesting. Uh, one of the people I, I read a lot of on my channel is Neville Goddard. And he says something radically different about reincarnation and what happens when you die. He was advocating, um, not saying theoretically, saying, I know this, I, 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 I know this one, that when people die, they don't necessarily become babies again, that they'll be reborn in, in as a 20 year old and in a similar world. And, and, and they'll, they'll purposely choose to do that. Like it, uh, he called it the wheel of recurrence, which was a, something mm -hmm. that was famous in the old days, the idea of eternal recurrence, almost like a groundhog's day type of thing where you're going back. And, and, and what I've decided is that there's some souls that that, that works for their evolution. Um, there's some souls that's what they need they need to go back and and re-experience and 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 go through that process again until something else comes out so i i can see reincarnation in that kind of there's infinite possibilities after you die it's not just one thing that happens right you get that exactly right that's fantastic discernment so what my buddy neville is talking about is what the soul needs for its own evolution Right, the 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 multiverse is a multifrequential, multidimensional hall of mirrors designed mm -hmm. for self mastery. Well, there are certain souls that need to that need to process their experience in that way by almost having exactly what he described. They're not ready to completely close the door and that do a life review and move on to something totally different. They're just right. not ready to do that. They prefer to work in a way where they're going to do what, exactly what he said. Now, from my direct experience, that's the minority. The minority. That's the minority of 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 of. Uh, temporarily individualized units of consciousness or what we would call a soul that would be the minority there are certain souls that actually prefer to work that way because that we all get to evolve in our own way and in our own time there's no mm -hmm. rules there's no rules to it the only thing is we must evolve we must evolve so that's one way that a, a minority of souls chooses to work with themselves because they that's how they like to do it Right. And other souls, it's the total opposite. Right. Some souls, very few, some souls, when they reincarnate, they actually make sure that there are guides and helpers, what we would call our guardian angels, but our guides and helpers, that they have no communication, believe it or not, mm -hmm. no communication with their guides and helpers because they want to make it as difficult as possible. They want the highest degree of, of difficulty because if you nail that, your score goes up. So, there's more sentience accrued, there's more love, there's more wisdom, there's more talents and abilities that are accrued. So nothing's off the table. Nothing is off the table in terms of, and like I said, this is why I feel that our God's creation, the multiverse, and I am able to interact with other gods. And I've said this before and I'll say it now and it really doesn't matter to me anymore. The reason why I'm so weird is because I'm not from this God. I'm right. not from this God. I am from a completely different God, which is why I can work with myself in this way and why my consciousness is so different. Now, what I have found is that our God, the multiverse, this is the most incredible piece of imagination that's ever been imagined into reality. There's nothing like the multiverse anywhere. Other gods that created environments the, those environments are nothing like this multiverse. They're absolutely nothing, nothing like it at all in, in, in any shape or form. Mm -hmm. How I would describe some of these things, it's very difficult to find words to describe what it's like. But this multiverse is the most fascinating experience and, and a creation or form of imagination, I think, that, that's ever been birthed. And I think it portends the greatest evolution of consciousness, the way that it was constructed. And my obsession... As, as with our God, the obsession is with its own evolution and the evolution of its creations, which, which would be everyone here. So I feel the same way and that I'm obsessed with the evolution. I'm obsessed with the evolution of consciousness. I'm, I'm obsessed with the evolution of my own consciousness and therefore help, helping everyone else with, with the evolution of consciousness. So this, this is the most amazing place I think that's ever been constructed. And it gives all... all incarnate beings that incarnate as human the ability to evolve in their own way and in their own time because it portends the greatest efficacy of the evolution of consciousness possible which is why incarnating incarnating on earth has been obsession of mine 
so I can continue in my efforts to aid our God and the evolution of consciousness itself. Now, do you have direct memories of your reincarnations? Um, are, are they all vivid memories or, or is it just sort of a knowing? Tell me about your, your reincarnational memory once you sort of awoke. Okay, so when I was a kid, I used to leave my body all the time. I mean, I still do now, but when I was a kid, I used to just leave my body all the time. So I, I knew right away that I wasn't really RJ, if that makes sense. I wasn't really the human character. I knew that from, from jump. My earliest memories are literally of me outside of my body, looking back at my body. Those are my earliest memories as RJ. So I was never under the delusion or illusion that, uh, that I'm this guy, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I had I had vivid memories of experiences in different incarnations when I was a kid. I wasn't exactly sure what was happening. I wasn't exactly sure what was happening. But uh, obviously, much later on, and I'll get to that, I was able to now understand what was even going on back when I was three years old, four years old, five years old. So I would have vivid memories as if I was experiencing it again. As a, as a different uh, character, right? In a in a in a totally different body, in a totally totally different um, time frame, timeline, mm -hmm. even. Okay, now I kind of dismissed that for a while because I I felt like it wasn't giving me. I wasn't focusing on being RJ. If I was becoming too involved in my other lifetimes, right? It's like I, I'm here now, and I need to be fully here now. Mm -hmm. So I kind of kind of left that alone. But I'll jump ahead. I'll jump ahead to after I got paralyzed. And uh, there were certain names when I was a kid that I would say over and over again. I'm not going to say those names, but there were certain names that I would say over and over again. And they were actually other incarnations of me or that I was them and they are me. Right. Other other projections of the higher self that I'm from. So I would say these names over and over again as a kid, almost like a mantra. And I think I was trying to wake myself up. I was literally trying to wake myself up. And I, I, I would say there was two names in particular, I would say over and over and over again. And it only really made perfect, absolute sense uh, until shortly thereafter that I became paralyzed. Because well, when I woke up from surgery, I had, I, had, I had fully awakened again. And there was a moment where I was in, I was in the room. I had, gotten, I had gotten discharged from the hospital. I was in the room and it's not unusual for other incarnations to show up and I would speak with other incarnations, even though I'm from the same higher self. And from a human perspective, we would say that's me and I'm them. That's sort of true and sort of not true because we come from the same higher self. So in that sense, the other incarnations are me and I am them. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we have to let go of linear. We have to let go of linear because it doesn't work that way. But I remember vividly, I was in my room and an incarnation showed up and then another incarnation showed up and then another and then another and there were about five there were about five incarnations that were just in the room with me and i'll and i'll share one i'll share one one is merlin so there were five incarnations and merlin was there was there in the room with me and they're all just looking at me not saying anything saying absolutely nothing emanating nothing i wasn't i wasn't getting anything from them because everything is telepathic so they were emanating nothing, Brian. They were literally just just standing there. And there I am, in, you know, lying in my bed, looking at everybody, right? And I could tell Merlin, like, kind of wants to say something, right? So I'm just looking at him, and I'm like, what? What? <laughs> and he looks at me, and he looks at me, and he's like, and I'm like, what? What? Right? And he just looks at me, and he goes, And in that moment, everything that I had felt as a kid, because some of those incarnations were in there, everything that I had felt, everything that I had known uh, about why I'm so weird and why I'm so different, why my consciousness is so odd and why I can do strange things. I knew in that moment, everything had been confirmed for me. Uh, but that was only well, about seven, maybe about seven years ago. I suspected since I was a child but that was the confirmation because then at that point I was able to communicate with them all at that point. Once I kind of realized what the, what the gig is here is RJ, <laughs> what the, what the gig is here is RJ and uh, kind of what was going to happen or what was meant, 
what what was meant to be. Um, but I remember that moment like like it was yesterday, and it was um, I needed I needed to have that, Brian. I, I I needed to have that. I needed the confirmation for me to continue my work as RJ, because there was there was there was zero point zero 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 one percent of wait this can't really be true can it this is crazy there's there's no there's no way there's no way even though i suspected it suspected it, and had all these different experiences in my life and all these different communications in my life but in that moment it was a hundred percent it was a hundred percent known and uh thank goodness for it because i feel it really helped me to continue my work as uh as rj now, one person we both share a, a mutual fascination and interest with is Count St. Germain. I've read um, the I Am Discourses and um, just love his teachings. And, you know, more and more I find other books and and I read about the history of, of St. Germain. Um, so I'd love to share your perspectives on his teachings and why, why it's so popular now. It's really fascinating why a lot of these older teachings are coming back and so many people are interested in such a... It, Let's be honest, it's a very simple teaching. The I am teaching the way that Count St. Germain is teaching it is, is very simple, but so profound. Uh, we, we really needed to understand this perspective. Well, I would, I would say that you can always count on the count. <laughs> okay, so uh, um, I think part of his, uh, his otherworldly wisdom is the simplicity. And I think that's part of the essence of the projections from that higher self, such as Merlin, Moses, St. Germain, Plato, Gilgamesh, to, to name a few, Francis Bacon, the true author of Shakespeare. The part of part of the, the otherworldly, because that those incarnations are incarnations of ascended masters, those ascended masters are from the same higher self. That higher self is from a different God. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I make no bones about it. I'm from that same higher self. Lots of people have already figured that out. So I think part of what makes uh, that particular incarnation um, so important is that he is an embodiment. And that particular incarnation was kind of like um, represents represents that this this kind of consciousness he is an embodiment of the way that humanity is going to be working with itself throughout this next age he really is the embodiment of that consciousness he is the he is the and the, the incarnations the aspects of that higher self that he's part of and i named a few of the other incarnations that higher self is going to be projecting aspects of itself that we will then deem as and those aspects will be called an ascended master those teachings that specific vibration those specific understandings, so simple, just as you said, Brian, so in, because it's mastery, it's so simple, but it's so immediate, so powerful and so tangible. And that's how you that's how you know you're working with mastery. And the count embodied. He is that. And same with those other incarnations, by the way, Merlin, Moses, St. Germain, Francis Bacon, Plato and yes, uh, R.J., they, these incarnations embody a wisdom. They carry a frequency and an emanation that helps liberate humanity and move it to the next level of consciousness. And that particular, that particular lifetime was so key in terms of, in terms of moving humanity to this, to this next, this next level of understanding. We're going to be working with the teachings of, of St. Germain. We're going to work with the teachings of RJ over these next several hundred years without question, because they're so simple that anyone can do them but they're so profound and so true and so tangible. It's the way that we're meant to work with each other because it leads to experiential understanding of the self. Experiential understanding of the self. No more conceptualizations or beliefs. Master Sananda, who, who we know as Christ, one of the incarnations we know as, as Christ, who by the way, Joseph, the earthly father of Christ is an incarnation of Saint Germain, <clears throat> Christ took a certain way of operating to its pinnacle, to its to its zenith, the purification by believing in him, by purifying himself and being able to work at the height of belief is what carried us into this next stage. The next stage is we can no longer evolve our consciousness through belief. 
because beliefs are things that whose landing spot lie outside of the self. And we now understand that the self is everything. So we're moving into this age, this age of Aquarius, this age of St. Germain. We're moving into an age where everything must be experiential. So it must be tangibly known. And that is the unveiling of more of the I am. And that's really what that it, what what this is. And his channeling, him being channeled by Edna, Edna Ballard <clears throat> and Guy Ballard. And Edna Ballard is a female incarnation of El Moria. El Moria is Master M. For those who don't know who El Moria is, El Moria is an ascended master. El Moria was Akbar the Great. El Moria was, was uh, King Arthur. El Moria was Sri Yukteswar, the guru to Paramahansa Yogananda, also uh, a self-realized uh, God consciousness being. So we're, we're moving into this new stage of experiential wisdom. And he is really the embodiment. He is the embodiment. And that's why his teachings are so... And you've worked with St. Germain. Mm -hmm. You've worked with other incarnations Brian of that same higher self, right? Okay. So they really resonate with you because you actually have a personal, tangible understanding of it, right? And these are the teachings that humanity is going to be using to, to move forward, certainly over the next 300 years without question. These are the teachings. And it's 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 part of why um, I, I push myself uh, as much as I do to write books constantly to come up with as many courses and classes as I can, to do in-person events, uh, because I know how important it is. I know how absolutely important it is. It's a tremendous um, honor. Uh, it's my passion, it's my love. It's also an absolutely awesome responsibility to know that you're the one that is supposed to be doing exactly what it is that you're doing, because it's it's the right ingredient that's that's needed. And the count, count that incarnation is very, <laughs> he, he was able to master things. He was a master of teleportation. And he was he was a master of alchemy, still is a master of alchemy, and that he's he was able to do things that is just quite extraordinary. Now, I'm gonna share something about the count that really no one knows except for those who take some of my classes. Mm -hmm. The count uh was had developed quite a personality. He could talk to anyone. He could entertain anyone. He he almost seems as if he knows everything and he can kind of access anything and seems to know, know everything. Now that, by the way, that trait is very similar in all of the incarnations from that higher self, by the way. This ability to access everything in this deep, deep reservoir of wisdom and knowledge, it's almost unfathomable. But here's the thing about the count that nobody really knows. And I mean, nobody really knows. He had a partner in that lifetime. Mm -hmm. who preferred to be behind the scenes, never really wanted to be seen, never really wanted, wanted to be known in any way, and was doing the exact same high-level work as the Count. And this soul was doing it behind the scenes. And that's the soul that we would know, that we have known as Paramahansa Yogananda. Now, that incarnation with the Count, his partner, his partner in crime, he's not crime, his partner in crime that no one knew about is an, another ascended master. So when St. Germain would go go out and, and wow everyone and do all these things, and that's for real. I mean, he's he is the count. He would agree to do things and to take on tasks because he knew that his partner would take care of half of it for him. Right. So he would come back and say, hey, listen, we got to do this. We got to do that. We got to transmute this. We have to transmute that. We, we have to access this. We have to access that. And, and that other ascended master was like, yeah, no problem. But that ascended master preferred to work behind the scenes, which is why that incarnation of Yogananda was very interesting because Yogananda had to be so front facing. Um, to come all the way back, the teachings of Saint Germain, Saint Germain is the embodiment and all his incarnations is the embodiment of the age of the age of Aquarius. It's humanity is going to work with itself in a way that it's going to leave behind the 3D matrix. And we do that by working with the I am directly and realizing that the self is whole and complete as it is and we stop putting our focus on anything outside of the self and we start working with the self and bringing out more of what we really are and that will get reflected in the outer world and that is actually how we move up the move up the frequencies how we ascend the frequencies and that is actually how we create heaven on earth so there's been a little bit of 
changed from the times that St. Germain was teaching because there was a, a little bit of a focus on mystery schools and occult teachings and sort of a process from apprentice to, to master. And, and we're kind of in a different age where there's not necessarily a need for this secrecy behind the knowledge that's being presented. I'd like to get a perspective because I, I get people that say, oh, you, you need to go to the mystery schools to get this information. And, and my point is, no, you don't. This We're, we're in an age where um, a lot of this information is openly available and if we can access it differently. There's not necessarily this need to go through that process. What is your perspective on that? Well, I think you're a perfect example of that. What you keep providing for people on your on your channel is exactly that. You're providing sacred, advanced, enlightened wisdom constantly. You're a perfect example of that, Brian. It's part of the reason why I love you, because you keep you keep doing that. Thanks, Mark. So, and you're absolutely right. Now, I can I can give a, a metaphysical explanation as to uh, as to what what we're talking about. <clears throat> Let me go back to Paramahansa Yogananda. Okay, who could have taught anything? Mm -hmm. Could have taught anything. Okay, so he taught Kriya Yoga because the base frequencies of humanity were lower at that time than they are now what does that mean so he had to teach kriya yoga because for for human beings to reach some sort of level of meditation they had to go through the body because the frequencies are so low and they're so identified with their form and their physicality so that's why he taught kriya yoga okay the base frequencies of humanity are much higher i can come here and teach instantaneous meditation and self-healing like i do because the base frequencies are higher now because the base frequencies are higher that means the the general education of the human mind is higher so it can work with these teachings in a more open way it was preserved before because the base frequencies were so low there were so few human beings that were going to be able to work with themselves properly by tapping into these true as the, the true esoteric wisdom and by the way 95 percent of all the esoteric wisdom that's that's permeated this earth are from two different beings master r and buddha they are the providers of almost all the esoteric, and they're different incarnations. They are essentially the providers, and I can explain why that is. We are in a, our base frequencies are higher. More human beings can work with themselves in a very advanced way. So therefore, the information is being made more readily available as opposed to it being hidden or in the secret societies. And the origination of the secret societies is not what's happened to them at all. They were infiltrated. The origination of the secret societies were to preserve the sacred wisdom by these mystics and masters that would keep coming here and keep providing these enlightened teachings to humanity. It was to preserve them. But like most things here in the lower frequencies, it, it gets, it gets uh, co-opted. It gets infiltrated, it gets inverted and perverted, and then used against the actual collective conscious when the whole point was to give the collective consciousness these teachings. So we're going to keep having a proliferation of these of these advanced, enlightened, of these self-mastery teachings because the base frequencies are higher and more human beings will be able to work with them. All they have to do is have it available. And that's why I said what you're doing by putting things on there by Neville Goddard, by putting things on there... Uh, the I am discourses by, by having RJ on your show, you're, excuse me, you're doing exactly that. You're making it readily available for humanity. And, and that's the key. Is there, is there information that we haven't really publicly accessed or discussed that, that I can present to my channel that we're ready for that maybe we haven't <clears throat> really, that, that it has not reached the form of collective consciousness yet. Okay. The, yes, <laughs> there are there are more teachings. There are absolutely more teachings. <clears throat> and I, I give my word, I'll do my best to make sure that they're all here by the time I leave my body without question. I think the bigger, what's more important than more teachings is the mastery of the ones that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I really feel that there's an there's an there's almost enough here already that would allow humanity to liberate itself once and for all. I really feel that way. Mm -hmm. Are there more teachings? Yes, there are, there are more teachings. But if we can master the ones that are here, if we can master the ones that are already here, mastery, I'll give an example. So <clears throat> the first book, Supercharged Self-Healing, the Ascend the Frequencies Healing Technique. Okay? Now, the originator, the true originator of Reiki, 
is an incarnation of Master R, which we call Saint Germain, but the Saint Germain or the higher self that projects pieces of itself is known as Master R. Saint Germain is an incarnation of Master R. Master R is the true uh, downloader of the Reiki symbols, the true downloader of the Reiki symbols. Now, if we if we look at and and Reiki itself, and there were 432 Reiki symbols originally. Uh, they got abused, so they kind of fell out of the collective consciousness. So if, if we look at the Ascend the Frequencies healing technique, the healing technique I used to unparalyze myself from the chest down and overcome life-threatening conditions and all this kind of stuff, and that's how thousands and thousands and thousands of people, you could think of it as a continuation of Reiki. Mm -hmm. You could absolutely think of it as a more, and it is more advanced. It's absolutely more advanced. A more advanced and holistic system or modality of healing that was built upon energy and energy healing, such as Reiki. So in this incarnation, it's ascend the frequency healing technique. We've built upon the foundation of things that was already there. If we can master what's already here, right? The mind, the finite mind that's bankrupt, that always wants more and more, the ego mind identity, that always wants more and more information, Brian. Even when it has gold, it's still looking for silver or platinum. Even when it's got the gold, it's good. looking for something else. It's just what it does, right? It's mm -hmm. just what it does. It's okay. So if we can start to master the teachings that are here now, that compulsion to reach for something more or something else will stop. Just the teachings in the first two book, the first two books, Supercharged self Healing and Change Your Mind will liberate anyone, will absolutely liberate mm -hmm. anyone. It We must be diligent. We must dedicate ourselves to these, to these things and let me just add one more thing about, and there are more teachings that are coming that are, that are not currently being bandied about, so to speak. I want to say something about advanced teachings, truly enlightened teachings, <clears throat> how effective they are. But more importantly is that this takes discipline. This takes absolute discipline. Part of the spiritual, from my perspective, mm -hmm. part of the spiritual community is that it should be effortless. There's, it should just happen right away and it should be effort. Okay, this is insane. That's never going to happen in the third frequency. Let me let me say that again. That's never going to happen in the third frequency. That happens in the higher frequencies. That happens in that. It's not going to happen that way here. It's This is where you learn about determination and will. This is how you learn about determination and will. You must apply it, apply it, apply it. You must be diligent. You must be voracious. You must not stop. That's really the key. And I feel that that's really missing from all teachings about, oh, it's just like this. It's just, no, it isn't. No, it is not. And anyone who's telling you it's just like this, they have no idea what they're talking about. Unparalyzing yourself and doing all these kind of things takes a level of determination and will that will force the evolution of your consciousness because you have to keep applying it over and over perpetually. It forces your graduation. Anything that happens like that, there's very little, there's very little self-gnosis or self-awareness in a process that happens like that. Now, anyone who's wanting things to be instantaneous like that, don't worry. The fifth frequency is where everything happens like this, not the fourth. The mm -hmm. fifth frequency is you snap your fingers and it kind of just happens. It's never going to happen that way in the third frequency. Why? It's not designed to. It's not designed to. The teachings are already here for authentic liberation, authentic self-mastery, authentic self-healing, liberation from the finite conditioned, conditioned mind. They're here now. If we can master them, master what's already here, we'll be so far ahead of, of wanting more teachings We'll realize we don't even need more teachings. We have everything that we need right now. Along those lines, I'd like to ask you about a, a, a recent sort of transformation. Um, when I first started really awakening in, in, in my channel, I, I would meditate forever, you know, three times a day, long periods of meditation. I would I would teach you, you got to really meditate, you know, and um, I host a meditation every week on my channel. And I've always wanted to try to make meditation fun, but I, I had this realization that it's a limited perspective to sit and I'm going to meditate when I realize I'm I'm meditating all the time, 24 hours a day. You're always meditating. And it's a huge change in, in how I look at it. This is not something I need to go and do and sit down 
and 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 get in the right position and meditate because um that's what I'm always doing and I'd like to get your perspective that it's uh it's a good starting point like what we would do in kindergarten but really we must come to the realization that we're we're never not meditating right yeah but brilliant so brilliant observation by the way my friend okay how I describe it I've taught lots of people in meditation how I describe it is that the self the I am the self is meditation Okay, mm -hmm. we exist before there's a thought, before there's an emotion, before there's a bodily sensation. The I am must already be present for a memory even to be formed. Okay, so we are meditation. Because we are meditation, it doesn't require an effort. Mm -hmm. The only effort is in trying to be something and someone that you're not. So meditation is actually effortless. And as you know, in my book, I do real magic, magic with a CK, real magic tricks to automatically bring you back into the present moment, right? And one of them that people seem to really love and get it's very effective, pretend that you just arrived here. No past, no future. Mm -hmm. Okay, Pet, so now th the thinking is past, future, past. It's gone. Now that's meditation in one second without any effort because you already are meditation. Don't bother with past or future. You'll start to realize that you're always right here, right now. So don't even bother with past or future. Just mm -hmm. normalize being present. And this is really, when we can normalize being present, we're going we're gonna to invite in a supreme intelligence into our life. Because by being present, the higher mind flowers. And we have direct connection to everything only when you're present. So that's, that's part of this paradigm shift that you realize that anytime you're fully here now, fully engaged, us having this conversation, anytime you're fully engrossed and engaged and engulfed in what you're doing, that's meditation. That's meditation because what you're experiencing is the self directly. The self directly. What you lose, you lose the false self. That's why people say, I lost myself. I was meditating and wound up being six out. Right, because you lost the fragmented mind. You lost the false character. And that's why meditation feels so good because you're experiencing the fullness of the I am. So 100%, we are meditation, which means there's nothing we have to do to meditate, nothing. We exist before the thought, before the experience, before the bodily sensation, just be engaged in what you're doing, walking meditation, talking meditation, playing meditation, doing the dishes meditation. Doesn't make it, doesn't make a difference. It's yeah. all meditation. We are meditation i agree 100 percent. it's it's a huge a revelation it's i am not i was or i will be it's it's i am you you got eternally eternally right Eter always 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 and it just becomes a matter of what we're putting our attention on but that what you just said is a universal eternal truth now if we let the finite mind start to want you're still here now mm -hmm. but you're letting your mind wander and you can only think about the past and think about the future now. But I am also walking around in my imaginings, mm -hmm. even though it's in the present. What I'm what, what I'm experiencing right now is what I was imagining in the past, even though it's in, in the present moment, right? A yeah. little bit. It, it's trippy because our, our the human mind in the lower frequencies operates with logic and linearity. Okay, which is a subset of space time, by the way, my friend. That's part of being all the way down here. We experience everything through, if it doesn't make sense and it doesn't happen linearly, right? We can't, it doesn't get processed by the human mind. We move up the frequencies, that's, that, that leaves, that leaves. The higher mind starts to experience that everything is, there really is only one now seen from an infinite amount of perspectives. Everything mm -hmm. is happening concurrently and in parallel. And when we start to, and that's what I mean about the supreme intelligence. We can start to work with the supreme intelligence when we master being present. All the information becomes available to us, all our other incarnations, all these other parallel conditions, all these things that are happening concurrently, all these different timelines that are happening are available when the higher mind opens. None of it, none of it is available through the conditioned programmed uh, subconscious pattern egoic mind. None of it is available through that, zero. So the supreme intelligence enters through just through being present. And as you just said, Everything is meditation when you're present. If you're just engaged in what you're doing, mm -hmm. that's that's all it takes. But the, it's the normalization of that. That's why you said I kind of stopped doing that because you have normalized the state, Brian. 
That's mm -hmm. why you've normalized the state. You've done it so much. You've gotten so good at it that you're just in meditation now. You don't even have to, oh, let me sit and, and do something. That's that's the actor performing actions, right? That's mm -hmm. the ego mind identity, checking something off the to-do list and to look what I did today, right? So mm -hmm. we, we move past that. Now you moved past it because you're so diligent that you got good at it, that you've mastered being present. And so now you realize the truth that you're always in meditation. I would love to get your perspective of alien intelligence, <laughs> you, um, on a, you know, UFOs, um, from what you know, explain this phenomenon. People claim that they're star seeds. They're reincarnated from other planets. People say that there's multiple different alien civilizations watching the earth right now. What's the truth? How, what, what do you know? I mean, obviously on some level, it's, it's not important. But I'm still fascinated by it, right? Yeah, okay. So, and I, I got to tell you, I was too. So I, I really don't remember when it was, how, how many years ago. I just don't remember. But I can tell you that there was a three or four month period <laughs> where I meditated six, eight hours, 10 hours, you know, like a lunatic. And the whole thing was just to communicate with aliens. That's the only thing that I was doing all yes. day long for several months was interacting with aliens. And I, I kept track. There was 179 different aliens, different races, different species. I have a whole notebook on it. I wow. just invited, I just, I just invited the CIA to break in. and get, get That's another book we need to read. Right. So I kept track of all these different aliens that I was communicating with. The short version of what you said is yes, they're all over the place. Okay. But when we can start to understand, I think this is the door that will open this up for everybody. Mm -hmm. Earth is what I call a pan-frequential being. Okay. What, what the hell does that mean? Okay. So it means that Earth exists where we are. Obviously, we're experiencing Earth, right? These first bottom three frequencies band together to, to form height, weight, and width, which we call three-dimensional. So we have our version of Earth. There's, there's Earth that exists in the fourth frequency. There's a version of Earth in the fifth and the 6th, and the 7th, and the 8th, and the ninth, and the 10th, and the 11th, and the 12th. So this is what I mean about Earth being a pan-frequential a pan being. There's also parallel versions, billions and billions and billions of parallel versions of Earth, and every single one of those Earths as well, in the 3rd, and the 4th, and the 5th. Okay, right? I mean, you can't even keep track anymore, right? You just can't keep track. Do aliens, aliens are right here, right now, operating in the 4th frequency. So there are a whole nother version of earth where they, they can make themselves visible in their right ear. I used to sit, I don't know, maybe I'm revealing too much. Maybe I'm not. No, okay. please do. I it, used, it, okay. Go for it. I, I, used to, I used to sit, I lived in an area that had uh, mountains, right? And I used to be able to sit, climb up some of the mountain and sit. And there was, it was just wide open. It was just absolutely beautiful. And I used mm -hmm. to adjust the electro meditation. I used to adjust the electromagnetic frequency of my brain so I could move up. I would ascend the frequencies. I'd go into the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, you know, and so on. Now, when, when you do that, everything that exists in these higher frequencies just reveals itself. So the point is, is that it's all here right now. It's not over there or out there. It's all here right now. It's just vibrating in a different frequency. It's mm -hmm. all it's all in the same space. Think of a rubber band ball, right? all those different rubber bands, all those different timelines, all woven together, all touching one another, all influencing one another, and all in the same space. So it's a lot like that. It's all right here. We have to we have to adjust our frequency and go past physical sensory perception, right? Because the, the body is attuned to and part of the local environment. The I am is not. It's attuned to and part of God itself. So we can literally adjust the frequency of our brain through detachment and through being diligent of meditation. We can start to see what is actually right here, just in higher frequencies. The, the first dimension, right? We call this the third dimension. It's not the first, the first dimension is all physical universe. It's packed, Brian, it's packed. Mm -hmm. If you adjust, if you adjust the mind and you go up and you start to look, there's no space. This, this place is jam packed. And aliens are just part of it. Aliens are just part of it. Now, let me just add a little bit more to this. 
No one is from here. No one is from the physical universe. Absolutely no one. This this identification, this is part of the spiritual community that drives me nuts. Drives Ooh. me absolutely nuts. I'm a star seed. I'm a, no, you're not. No, you're not. Stop. We've all had lifetimes as aliens. We'll continue to have lifetimes as aliens. We've all had lifetimes as, as a human. We'll continue to have lifetimes as human. No one is from the physical universe. No one is a star seed. If someone says, I am, and they put something after the I am, and they identify with it, you know that it's incorrect because anything after I am is just a temporary experience. It's not what you are. That's the easiest way to know that. So if someone is identifying, I'm a Pleiadian, I'm a star seed, I'm a this or that, we've all been everything. We've all been everything. No one comes from the physical universe. No one is, is, is from Neptune. No one. We are projections from our higher selves, which exist in much, much higher dimensions where there's no physicality whatsoever. It's just a mis, it's just a misidentification with a temporary experience. And the easiest way to know that is that anything you put after I am is just a temporary experience and not who and what you are. Aliens are everywhere. Part of what freaks people out is that aliens in higher frequencies can make themselves known and seen in lower frequencies and then phase out and go back to their, go back to their, which is why they can just disappear. That's how that actually works. So mm -hmm. if a fifth, if the fifth frequency alien wants to make itself seen and known, because we're all in the same space, as I said before, if it wants to make itself known, it can drop its frequency into where we are, and then all of a sudden we see it, and then all of a sudden they disappear, because then they go back to their air frequency, which is outside of our physical sensory perception. So that's why things come and go and disappear. That's exactly what is actually going on. It's changing in frequency, and that's why they can appear and disappear at will, make themselves known, and then just take off, and everyone is left, well, that wasn't real because there's no evidence. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Aliens and humans are part of life itself. And no one is human, it's a suit. No one is actually alien, it's a suit. No one is actually comes from the physical universe. We come from our higher selves, which are projections of God's source creator. So when we start to lose the I'm a this and I'm a that, we lose the story that we're telling ourselves, we'll start to actually tap into who and what we really are. And that's the greatest evolution of consciousness as well as the highest quality of life. I love that. My question is, is there beings from these higher frequencies trying to directly influence what is happening in this third frequency right now in the present moment in terms of world wars or politics are are they playing a role in trying to influence sometimes with malevolence or am i just getting caught up in some conspiracy theory is is, <laughs> is there some truth in that right there's absolutely truth in that there's, yeah. there's absolutely truth in that now if we want to talk about malevolent uh, yeah, absolutely. A absolutely. Are there malevolent entities? Of course. Are there benevolent mm -hmm. entities? Of course. Mm -hmm. Right? Of course. Okay. Now, human beings have temporary, as well, we're human, have temporary individualized free will that we talked about. Excuse me. So what really goes on in, goes on here is the manipulation of our free will. Mm -hmm. the manipulation of the free will. So a scenario was presented or leading someone in a direction they either think it's good for them or they're frightened into making a choice or they're coerced into making a choice, but ultimately the human being makes a choice. Right. Does that make sense? Does that make sense what I'm saying? Right. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, no, I just, I get the perspective sometimes that the level of manipulation, it, you know, it, it, it's controlling free will on such a level that, there needs to be an intervention by benevolent beings or if they're so, you know what I mean? I'm, I, I, I'm, when I sit back and just try to observe what's sort of happening, um, my, my observation is that there, the level of manipulation almost is completely removing the free will, even though free will is there. Uh, it's a deep seated structural thing that uh, I wish that I could play a role in at least uh, freeing them or giving knowledge or information from that sort of manipulation. Okay, brother, you're already doing it. Okay. You're already doing it. Just keep doing what you're doing. Okay. The 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 answer to this is because okay. So super advanced benevolent aliens show up and mm -hmm. fix everything for us, right? We we would learn nothing. Nothing. That, and that's the answer, my friend. That that's it. We right. the ev the evolution of consciousness 
this. Remember, I talked about success, the deepening of a reservoir of love and wisdom whose subsets are talents and abilities. That stops if someone does it for us. Right. That's why. Now, let me let me show you the other side of that. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's the reason why it's not happening. Because they would be robbing us of our evolution and they're, they're too wise and benevolent to do that. Okay. They also understand that these malevolent entities, which by the way, don't impress me at all. I want everyone to know that. I'm unimpressed. I'm unimpressed. Okay. These malevolent entities are providing what I call evolutionary tension. Okay. So they're definitely, they're trying to hold us down. All, all that stuff. Are they trying to do? Of course they are. Of course they mm -hmm. are. Okay. But that, Brian, that provides the evolutionary tension. So it's kind of like the bigger the challenge you have, the more, the more you grow because the more you realize you're capable of. Right. Right. If we all sat on the couch and played pole position, well, that might be fun. Okay. But if we all just sat on the couch and played pole position, there would be no evolution of our consciousness because we're not being challenged. Okay. So that's the, those are the two sides. When we can start to understand that, that the evolutionary tension is actually there for our progression. So we have something to work against. And at the same time, <clears throat> excuse me, the benevolent beings realizing what is going on. But if they stepped in and did everything for us, we don't grow. True. Sure. We absolutely, so there's this incredible uh, balance that is always going on, that is always going on. And let me add one more, one more thing about that. Some of these highly advanced beings, Brian, are dressed up in human suits, like yourself, that are doing fantastic work here. We keep thinking they need to look like, you know, some Andromedan or, or you know, or Pleiadian or whatever. <laughs> some of them do. Okay, many of these highly advanced souls are wearing the human suit right now. Like I said, just like yourself. So, the collective consciousness is always being helped. The ascended masters keep reincarnating over and over and over again. It's an accepted belief system that we're channeling them. If people really understood how channeling works and what they're really channeling, we'd have a, well, you know what? Let me explain a little bit about that. Okay. So when people say they're channeling St. Germain, let's mm -hmm. say they're, let's say, okay, they're channeling St. Germain. Okay. It's true when it's not. It's true when it's not. Okay. As we understand now, a soul, me, you, anybody, right? Is like a tentacle of an octopus and it's the higher self, right? Okay. So what happens is when that incarnation, but we'll, we'll stick with St. Germain, he's a, he's a popular character, right? So when St. Germain, when that incarnation ended, right? <clears throat> that, that tentacle, right? Got pulled back up. Now, if someone wants to channel St. Germain, what happens is the higher self then projects another piece of itself because St. Germain was an aspect of that higher self. It projects a piece of itself. And then this person is, is quote unquote, talking to St. Germain. Mm -hmm. Does it does that make sense? Makes sense. Totally. Okay, that's what's really happening. Right. Now, remember the the reason why we get confused about this is because we're we're locked into what I call body consciousness, which therefore we're stuck with a logic and linearity program, which are subsets of space and time, and so therefore we're really we're missing the big picture when we try to apply logic and linearity because everything happens all at once, right? Mm -hmm. But these highly advanced beings, Brian, they're here now. They're, they're here now. And by the way, they're always here. They're always here. And we can think of the Ascended Masters as like the the OGs. I don't know, whatever, whatever word you want to use. Right. Right? They are, they are products of the Elohim, these other gods that project pieces of himself. And they're they're always reincarnating. Always, always, always. And the, the two, the two most fervent, dedicated, and prolific <clears throat> ascended masters when it comes to to humanity and earth are Master M, El Moria, and Master R, St. Germain. They they have played the two biggest roles in the evolution of consciousness and the freeing of humanity than any of the other ascended masters. And part of that is because El Moria is from our God. Master M is from our God. Uh, Master R is not from our God, but he has a particular fondness for humanity. And he has he works very well with our God source creator in terms of its uh, its creation and its obsession with the evolution of its own consciousness. So uh, those are the two ascended masters that are the most prolific and work the most with um, with humanity. And one, if not both, are always incarnate on this planet. Let me say that one more time. One, if not both, Master M and Master R are always incarnate on this planet. Edna Ballard, 
mm-hmm. the female female incarnation of El Moria, Master M, left her body February 11th, 1971, and Master R reincarnated February 12th, 1971, only a few hours later. Yeah. A lot of those advanced beings are behind the scenes. Yes. They're, they're playing the role like uh, Parmahan says, you know, the, the, a lot of them are doing work with that we don't see and and, and it's it I, I can sense that i can i can sense their influence and that's what's so cool about it i wanted to ask you because we were having a little brief conversation before we started talking um and you know i have i want to uh, publish another book soon and you have these amazing books and a great publisher and i wanted to get your story of how you started writing your books um i know that there was a story behind it yeah yeah <clears throat> the, the, the publishing journey right okay right so um, I started, work, even when I was still in a wheelchair, I, I started working with people about how to heal and, and become self-realized. And eventually there were so many people I was working with, they just kept saying, you need to write a book. You need, so everyone knows the ascendant frequency healing technique and all these understandings. So I said, yeah, you know, you, you're right. I'll, I'll, I'll write a book. So I wrote the, the first book, Supercharged Self-Healing. I wrote it and I wanted to to find a publisher only because I wanted it to be in bookstores. I wanted it to be readily available. And there's a certain, um, that's the right word. Like if you have a publisher, it, it, it's kind of like the, the work is elevated a little bit because a publisher had to believe in the work and that kind of thing. It's kind of like also getting an agent, right? For a publisher to look at your work, you kind of have to have an agent, which is even more difficult than getting a publishing deal. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the point is I wrote the book. And I did all this supercharged and I did all this research about what publishers I could send my manuscript to unsolicited without an agent. Cause I didn't, I didn't have an agent. There's only like 300 or 350 agents in totality. I know it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Mm-hmm. So, so I started researching what publishers I could just send my manuscript to. And it was a very, 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 very small list. Right. And most of them were very, very small publishers. But at that point, I didn't really care. I just wanted to get it out there. And I just wanted a publisher to kind of justify the level of my work by having a publisher believe in it, right? Okay. So after about a year, I finally had the, I, I finally had Ozark Mountain Publishing. Ozark Mountain Publishing said, wow, this is great. We'd love Dolores to publish Cannon. So, Exactly. Yeah. So I'd love to publish your, your work, RJ. It's fantastic. This is great. Here's a contract. So I was, I mean, I had a party. I was like, finally, after writing the book in a year of trying, right? So I, I got the publishing contract. Brian, I don't I don't know what publishing, uh, now I do, but I don't know what a publishing contract should look like. I don't know what's fair. What's, I have no idea. No, no clue, right? So I'm like, okay, sort of a dream has come true. And now I don't know what to do because I don't know if I should sign the contract or not. I don't know if this is a good contract or this is a bad contract, right? So I'm like, well, what do I do now? So then I started researching agents that would uh, that would accept query letters from people that had written a book and that were open to new submissions. So I, I went through a gigantic list of those people, started sending out, say, hey, I, I got a contract and blah, blah, blah. I don't know what to do. I don't know if I, and most of them just said, I'm not taking on any new clients, not taking on any clients. Probably about a hundred of them said that. Well, this one agent said, you know what? I'll take a look at your contract, RJ, and I'll let you know if it's you know, if it's legit or not or whatever. So I sent her the contract and she, she must've replied in like 20 minutes. She's like, RJ, this is a totally legitimate contract. You're totally okay to, you're totally okay to sign it. But I'll tell you what, your book and your story is intriguing. Do you want to send me your book and I'll read it over the weekend? So I said, really? Over the weekend, you'll read it. Not six months from now, you get back to me. She laughed. I said, no, I will read it over the weekend. What you've told me already is fascinating. So I'll you send me the book, I'll read it, and I'll let you know what I think. Great. I sent it to her. It was about 18 hours later, about 18 hours later. This conversation was on Friday, Saturday, like by around noon. She was, she was calling me back. She's like, RJ, let me just tell you something. Whatever you do, don't sign that contract. Why? You just said it was totally okay. Why would I not sign it? She said, listen, you have a bestseller, an unbelievable book, but the whole thing has to be rewritten. The whole thing has to be rewritten. You wrote it like a memoir. No one is interested in that. You've got to get to the healing technique right away, and you've got to get to the, the all the clients that you've helped with the healing technique. You have to rewrite the book. 
her name's Tina. I said, Tina, I spent a year writing the book. I spent another year getting a publisher. I spent months trying to even getting a hold of someone like yourself. It's been two and a half years already. You tell me to rewrite the whole thing. She goes, yeah. And she says, if you rewrite the book and you take it to the level that I think that you can, I'll represent you and I'll get you, I'll get you a really good publishing deal. So I said, okay, great. So you're going to sign me right now. She goes, I'm not going to sign you right now. <laughs> you got to, you got to rewrite the whole thing, send it to me. And if I think it's good enough that I can go to market with it, then I'll sign you as a client. So I said, all right, let me think about it, Tina. Let me think about it. I don't know if I want to rewrite the whole book. So let me think about it. So I thought about it and I, I knew she was right. I knew she was right. I was trying to convince myself to, to avoid rewriting the whole book. I rewrote the whole book. It took me about took me about two months, two and a half months to rewrite the whole thing. Sent it to her. Tina, we're ready to rock and roll. She's like, unfortunately, no, this is still, this is just, it's not oh, good wow. enough. That's just yeah. not good enough. Uh, that's what I said. I go, oh, wow. Well, so what do we do? She goes, you, 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 here's some changes I need you to make. It's just, it's not good enough, RJ. I'm just telling you, it's not. Not the, not the healing technique and not, but the book itself, it's not good enough. You got to rewrite it again. Here's some notes. Oh, so at that point, I'm like, this is crazy. So I followed her advice. I took another six weeks, made all these changes, sent it to her. What do you think she said? Not quite, not quite there, oh, RJ. Wow. No, this is the, this is a true story. I should have her talk about this. She's not quite there, RJ. You're almost there. You're almost there. I know what publishers will buy right away. I know what they'll buy. They won't buy this. You're almost there. Here's a few more notes. So I did that. I rewrote it again. Now we're like three years since getting a contract. Three years later, right? Mm -hmm. Three years late. No, well, not since getting a contract. The whole thing is about a three-year process. I finally send her another version. She's like, we're ready to go. We're absolutely ready to go. I say, okay, fantastic. She sends me over. I sign with her, right? She goes, okay, I'm going to go to market. I'm going to go to this publisher, this publisher, and this publisher. We're going to hear something pretty soon. I guarantee it. I said, okay, fine. COVID hits the next week. Everything shuts down. Everything stops. Everything mm -hmm. stops. I'm like, Tina, what does this mean? She goes, I have no idea. I have no idea. I can't get a hold of anybody. No one's in their offices. I have no idea. Uh, about two weeks later, she gets a note from two publishers and said that we're, we, we can't all get together. We can't have a, a board meeting to decide. She goes, but I just want you to know we are absolutely very interested in supercharged self-healing, these two publishers. And they they said just let the decks clear a little bit with COVID and all this kind of stuff, and then we'll be we'll be back in touch with you. So a couple of more months go by, and then it, as it turns out, these two publishers kind of fought over it, which was kind of like a a best case scenario in that they both wanted it. Right. And then we we eventually went with uh, Llewellyn Publishing after all that. That that Brian is the journey of my first book. And what it took, how long it took, the, the circuitous route that it took. The good news is, as I said, it's going into its ninth printing, which is absolutely incredible. The second book I wrote, I wrote in 30 days and I had an agreement two days after it was sent in. So I've had, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what happened. They're both, yeah. So I've had an eternity of having no idea and can't get a book deal to literally I mean, it took, we sent it to them on Friday, on Monday, they sent over a contract. So both, both things can happen, but it was meant to be that uh, I had to put that much work in. It was meant to be that Tina and I worked together. There's a lot of history between us as souls. She was meant to help me. She was meant to bring it out there. Um, and I'm so glad, obviously at this point, while I was doing it, I was like, this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. I, I should have just taken that first contract. So but it turned out to be the best thing I ever could have done. And I think it's reached so many people now. Uh, I'm so glad that it happened that way. But that's the story yeah. of the publishing of Supercharged Self-Healing. I think it's important to share just because also in the people that watch my channel, there's some amazing writers. Yeah. And they're they're going through a similar story. And don't give up on it. If you have to rewrite it, do it. And, you know, that just listen to that story and know that, you know, you, you can still do it. It's It's important. So yeah, a a anything worth doing will require effort. There's there's no there's no doubt about it. And that sure. was that really tested that really tested me. I mean, many times I'm like, why I I'm still working on this. I, I mean, it amazes deal. me when you look at like uh, Isaac Asimov, who's mm -hmm. who's pumping out like you know, 
12 books a year. And it's some of these, like, you know, Stephen King, who can just like crank out these books. It's it's amazing what they do. What it because writing is a laborious process. It's difficult. It's hard, right? It's very. It, it is, but it's like it's like meditation. It is. It's a it's a muscle, and that's why I wanted to point out that the second book, I, I Change Your Mind, uh, which debuted as a bestseller. I literally wrote that book as crazy as it's, I wrote that book in a month. Because I had gotten good through super self healing, right. rewriting appearance, do it again, RJ, do it again, RJ. So I had gotten, I had developed the muscle of, of writing, and I was able to literally, you know, put a, a pretty good book together in a very short period of time. And the third book that comes out, Access Superconscious, comes out in August. Mm -hmm. uh, that I mean, it, it was a little longer than a month, but it it didn't take me that long either. I mean, I think maybe that took about seven weeks for me to for me to write that book. And that's what starts to happen. It's just like with you in meditation, Brian. You meditate for hours and hours. And now you realize I'm in meditation. I'm already there. Mm -hmm. So anyone who has a passion about their work, about their book, or whatever it is, don't give up. Absolutely don't give up. And you may be thrown curveball after curveball after rewrite it, rewrite it, rewrite it, rewrite it. That's okay. If you know that you need to do this, if you believe in the work so much, then, then follow through. It, it'll be worth it no matter what I promise. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I know that there, there's some, some uh, great writers that are going to be inspired that, by that. And, and, and they need to hear it. I mean, the yeah. spiritual community itself eats itself a little bit, you know what I mean? And, and there's also another observation from that in my own experience in writing is write it a little bit for yourself. You're writing it for someone else, but don't, don't let your ego get caught up in the writing experience. Cause that's when it's not genuine when you're trying to write it thinking, oh, I need to do this as, um, I need to do it a certain way. And that's kind of maybe how your first, um, as you tuned into it more and more, mm -hmm. it wasn't, you weren't writing for someone else. It was, it, you were writing it for yourself, right? Yeah, that's a great, that's an absolute great point. The more that you can stay true to who and what you really are, the more powerful and authentic the work will be. And um, I, I hadn't developed the writing muscle enough as RJ that it took me several several attempts to write it write it write it rewrite it rewrite it rewrite it and like i said then we got to the point where the book I, so book three comes out book four is already january of 2026 um the books almost now write themselves they almost now write themselves i'm not going to say there's no effort because that's not true mm -hmm. but if you compare it to sort of the torturous rewriting and trying to make things work in terms of supercharge so Part of the problem, Brian, was that I, I wasn't making it accessible enough. And that was the feedback from Tina. She's like, RJ, you understand these things, but I got to tell you, no one understands these things. You do. And you're writing it as if everyone already understands it. You mm -hmm. have to keep quote unquote dumbing it down. So it's so simple, like the I am discourse. So it's so mm -hmm. simple that anyone would understand it. And that was the hardest thing for me. That was the absolute hardest thing for me was to make it so so accessible for anyone who reads it. But if you stick with it and you keep doing it, we get good at what we do repetitively. Plain and simple, sure. no matter what that no matter what that is. I've written so much, so many articles. I've written, I don't even know how many articles at this point. I'm working on book five now. They almost just not write themselves, but it it's this glorious, graceful, uh, as opposed to the First time, yeah. there was nothing glorious or graceful about it. It's now glorious and graceful. But just anybody who's struggling with, just stick with it. It's worth it. I promise. Do Do you have a routine? Do you write in the mornings or at night or every day or a certain period of time or how do you do it? Just inspiration. Inspiration. When you're ready. When it When it hits, right? I literally tell my partner. I said, "Listen, I I got to write this book." And she's like, "Oh, okay, okay." <laughs> so, right, right, yeah. I mean, that's what I got to write this book. So it's almost, so I, I've, I've heard it described in my favorite description. It's like a bowel movement. It, it has <laughs> to come out. It has to come out. Right. <laughs> you, yeah. It, and you know it, like you will know, just like you speak out of the bathroom. When, when you know that you have to give birth to this, it's got to come out. And I'm fortunate that I've, through all the work that I've done, I'm in a position where if I say, Hey, listen, for the next six weeks, I'm just going to write. I'm just going to write, write, write. So anything that I got going on, just reschedule or this or that, because I got to get this whole thing out. And I found once you've developed that muscle, that first draft, after you've developed the muscle, mm -hmm. that first draft is often spectacular 
because you've ironed out the kinks already through all the other projects that you've written. It's like, you know how to say it now. And it just, it just comes through. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, I just write on inspiration. I never say to myself, oh, I should probably write another book. I don't think I've ever had that thought, but I have been literally taken over I'm like, I, I got I to gotta write this right now. Mm -hmm. I, I got to write this book. And I literally will start writing it the next day. It's like, oh, I'm just going to write this book. So yeah. uh, some people might not have that. Um, they got to go to their job or whatever that is, right? right? Find the time when you're most inspired. When you're mm -hmm. most inspired. When I was in my 20s and I had a regular full-time job, I used to write at four o'clock in the morning. That's how I'd write. I'd write for two or three hours, then go to work all day. And then actually have some kind of energy drink and try to write for another hour or two at night. So sometimes it takes that kind of dedication, but write when you're when you're most energetic and you're most clear-headed, the work will be reflective of that. Don't write when you're stressed out, tired, exhausted, and don't write as an afterthought. Almost make it the most important thing, even if you have a job. Mm -hmm. This is just what's worked for me. I always made what I was creating the most important thing and anything after what I was creating was always secondary for me. I love that. So you have a conference, the freedom workshop on February 23rd, 24th and 25th. That's going to be in San Diego. If, if it's still around by then <laughs> and uh, you can find and get tickets at ascend the frequencies.com. So be on the lookout for supercharged consciousness, the next book, which will be out on August 8th, the day after my birthday um, this year. So um, can't wait to read that. And I most definitely will have you on so we can talk about that book when it comes out. And so thank you so much for, for the work that you're doing and, and um, giving me the time just to talk. It's, it's so much fun to talk with you. And I'm glad we recorded it because uh, I wasn't even thinking about this being some sort of interview. It's just really fascinating to talk to you. And so keep up the good work. Thank you so much. It's an honor to speak with you, Master R. Oh, well, thank Brian. I feel the same way about you, brother. You're, Thanks, you're a man. friend. You're a friend. I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, putting this out there so people can avail themselves of it. And you please keep doing what you're doing. And I am sure we'll talk again soon. We'll talk again soon. And welcome to the Reality Revolution. Thank you.